All right. Hello and welcome everyone to day two of the 2021 Skid Compass Summit. My name is Alyssa Kramer and I'm the Director of Specialized Projects for the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Kicking off our programming today are Dr. Yolan Walter of the University of South Florida Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital and Dr. Stan Goldman of Texas Oncology. Together, they will be presenting on Skid Variants and the Irish Traveler family. If interested, a PDF of their slides can be found and downloaded on the session's main page on the virtual platform agenda. A recording of this session will be uploaded to the virtual platform shortly after the session ends. There should be some time at the end reserved for questions uh, after the presentation. So please welcome Drs. Walter and Goldman. Thank you, Arista. We are very excited about being here. And uh, just for the rest of the audience, uh, we had a couple of new discoveries in the past week. So what we will present is a little bit different from the slides and we will be happy to share the new slide deck with, uh, with IDF and the rest of the group uh, after our presentation. So I would like to hand it on to Dr. Goldman to introduce himself. Hello, I'm Stan Goldman. I'm not an immunologist. I'm a pediatric hematologist, oncologist, and stem cell transplant physician in Dallas. And really, um, my senior partner who's retired, Dr. Carl Anarski, was really the first uh, physician that I'm aware of that got involved with the family in terms of uh, curative stem cell transplant for the uh, skid uh, in, in California when he was at Children's Hospital Los Angeles in the early 90s. And certainly, he's a, been a great mentor. And I've had the privilege over the past 20 years of, to take care of the family members initially with him, and now that he's retired, you know, with the rest of my team. And, uh, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you again, and my name is Yolande Walter. I am the Robert A. Good and that Chair of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology here in Florida at University of South Florida and Johns Hopkins Old Children's Hospital. And in, I encountered for the first time the Irish traveler name and concept when I was leaving our National Geography journals and there was a beautiful uh, photographic summary of Irish travelers in Ireland, uh, their life, uh, their challenges, and their their um, their advantage uh, in what they prefer in their lifestyle. I, I was really taken by the photos and um, and the memories, and I was excited uh, at the time when I could actually start connecting with this community on my personal level and clinically as well. And I would like to dedicate this talk to Dr. Notarangelo, my mentor from Harvard, who has taught me a lot about severe coma immunodeficiency and the type of variants we will see in this talk. And we also would like to thank the parents and family members of our shared patients. Without them, this talk would not be possible, and we, we would like to continue work with them, and we are very grateful for their contribution. So we will talk a little bit about um, communities in the United States that uh, seem to have some level of uh, problem accessing the highest level of medical care and, uh, and the diseases that they actually inherit uh, from each other and therefore they would really need to see us and, and be working closely with us uh, for uh, the medical care. We know about the old, uh, order of Amish people. Uh, this is a very large population. Um, we all uh, follow them through the Skid Compass program. Uh, a lot of initiatives are uh, towards them. And this is, this is really um, an important population that has been described to have skid genes, in particular ADA, reg deficiency, and all the other genes I listed here. You don't have to remember them, but what I want you to take from here is that uh, having these genes in the population will always put them at risk of babies born with higher rate um, of severe coma immunodeficiency. The second population that I wanted to emphasize in this talk is the Navajo Nation. The Navajo Nation um, is a very large nation of 170,000 individuals. They are primarily in Arizona, and they carry a very unique uh, skid variant in the Artemis gene. Fortunately, this uh, nation, Navajo Nation has a very close connection with Jennifer Puck and Mort Cohen, and there were significant efforts of helping them to find these babies before they get sick. Um, and furthermore, the, the community also ignited uh, some innovation in our field and gene therapy was developed in the Navajo Nation for Artemis deficiency that is not currently in clinical trials in San Francisco. So when you think about um, these two nations, and I want to put this in the context of our population, we will discuss, they're clearly 
a much smaller population. We estimate them to be around 75,000 globally, and the United States has only 20,000 of, of these um, individuals, and some of them are in different parts of the world, in Canada, of course, in Ireland, where they are coming from, uh, but also in the United Kingdom. And there were several uh, ideas about the time when they actually diverged, this population were diverging. Um, there are some initial papers on placing it to the time of the Great Famine. Uh, but then when we look back to recent publication, um, it is now even thought that in Europe around the 12th century, they diverted from the other populations and they created this unique, uh, very tight community. And what do we know, know about them uh, based on my little search of the literature and talking to, uh, to the family members is that they uh, speak a language of Kent, uh, not only in the Ireland, but also they mix it in into the English words here in the United States. Um, they are very distinct from other groups of um, travelers or migratory people, uh, such as the Roma, the Scottish, the English, or the New Age travelers. So they are very, very distinct, um, and uh, they operate in a clan-like structure in Ireland. In Ireland, they call them travelers. Here in the US, they call themselves a family. And there were a couple of derogatory terms in the past that we may have heard about. I listed them here. Uh, but basically, it refers to their line of work. And currently, uh, most of the families are linked to construction, home repair. Um, uh, some of the members of the families are now in higher education. So it's definitely a very diverse population in the United States. Curiously, in Ireland, they were just recently recognized as an ethnic group in 2017. So it's a very new development of their rights um, in Great Britain. In the US, however, there is no initiatives uh, to call them as an ethnic group. Um, the lifestyle of the Irish travelers is captured in several contemporary art, narrative, and photography. And I, I put a link here if you are ever interested in this beautiful summer that I have seen in National Geography. Um, Basically, what we have to keep in mind, though, that many of the Irish travelers uh, are now settling. And uh, with settling, they actually start to develop um, possibly new diseases. So autoimmune disorders were quite rare in Irish travelers in the past. However, with this um, settlement, it seems like that their microbiome is changing and a lot of the things are changing. And they unfortunately could acquire new disorders. And this is a nice paper in Nature and Medicine that talks about uh, the possibility of microbiome and health implementations of minorities who are enforced to change their lifestyle. And so what about the Irish travelers in the US? This is a, a picture of some of the families in the South. You can see the lavish and beautiful wedding where everybody is invited. Uh, the community is very tightly knit in, uh, in these communities. They are primarily Catholic by religion. And that implies that they are pro-life. Uh, so the families um, always um, insist on having children born as they are coming. And, um, and we have to help them to maintain their belief system and what they really care about because of their religion. The adults stay at home until they are married. Um, they join together in adversities. Dr. Goldman can speak out for that. I heard several stories about how much they care about each other which is so important, uh, especially when you have a child with disease such as severe coma immunodeficiency. So when you compare Ireland to the United States, um, um, there are some interesting differences. Uh, for example, in Ireland, um, around 50% of the population are children below the age of 15. So this is a highly enriched population for pediatric patients. And in fact, um, in between 650 to 850 traveler babies are born in Ireland yearly. And unfortunately, their mortality rate uh, was much higher than the general population, three and a half times higher. Uh, furthermore, 10% of these children in Ireland were dead before their second birthday. And the mortality was caused by accident, congenital malformation, and inherited metabolic disorders. So I wanted to sort of give you this highlight of the, of the community in Ireland, because uh, what we were trying to read and learn about is that uh, how much is this genetically inherited disorders are affecting the health of this population. And in the US, there's much less known about it. Um, and we, we think probably it's not as severe as the one in Ireland. So uh, we had the fortune to have uh, to talk to Dr. Sally and Lynch uh, several times uh, when we prepared this talk. And she has uh, cataloged uh, beautifully um, 
the disorder, the genetic disorders that occur in Irish travelers. Um, and they, she found over 104 genetic disorders. This is a, a huge number of genetic defects in such a small population. 90% of them were out, 90 were autosomal recessive, 13 were autosomal dominant. Um, and at that time, in the official report, there were no actual like immune deficiencies reported in the front page of the report. But as, as we went back and talked more about it, we could come up with a couple of candidates um, from her paper. I do want to emphasize uh, for those of you who are interested in newborn screening, that um, galactosemia was extremely high in the Irish travel population. And luckily we have newborn screening for this in the United States. But they sort of learned the hard way, and many of the families in Ireland did not use comet-based formulas. They had to go for special formulas from the very beginning because they didn't know if the baby would have the galactose deficiency or not. So fortunately, in the U.S., we have over 50 immune, uh, over 50 metabolic and immune disorders that we screen for, and it makes it much hard, easier for us to identify these problems. Uh, another important difference that I wanted to emphasize is that not every Irish traveler community had the same disorders. Depending on the region, the Northwestern, the Midlands, East and the Southeast, different, different genetic disorders accumulated. And that sort of talks about the, the tightness of the communities that although they all belong to this big um, Irish um, ancestry, they tend to have little pockets of um, close, closer communities. And uh, when we looked at the paper, and uh, I, I really thank Dr. Sally Lynch for all of this input, there were a couple of immune heme and ID-related abnormalities, and I would like to emphasize here very specifically Cohen syndrome. Uh, what they have found is that uh, several of the patients had neutropenia, hearing loss, and dysmorphism, and that actually coincided with a genetic defect of Cohen, Cohen syndrome. And Dr. Lynch pointed out to me that actually the same mutations were found among Irish, Irish travelers in the United States. So we think that um, probably this is a founder variant and we, we sort of, as we discussed it, uh, we anticipate more and more founder variants resurfacing in the United States to this community. So in among the skid genes that we're gonna focus on here, uh, what has been really described uh, in the Irish communities is the ADA deficiency. And um, there is a paper from the um, Great Ormond and, uh, group and also from Ireland from 2015, as they emphasize that ADA deficiency is an important, uh, very important genetic defect in this community. And this is why um, Dr. Leahy has just expressed to us that they're going to start newborn screening, uh, but not for skid in, in particular, however, in ADA deficiency. So in the United States, we screen for all of the different variants of skid, and we then we decipher them based on the genetic defect after we find them with the low tracks. In Ireland, they actually will go up front and look for ADA deficiency, and that's going to be their priority because of the publications that they, um, they, where they showed ADA being an important founder variant. So how about the US? Um, in the US, uh, there were only very, very small and few reports on the Irish travelers um, and their genetic disorders. And one of the first one was actually brought to my attention by Andy Jennery from the United Kingdom, who basically told me that the Omen syndrome uh, paper from Gilbert Omen at Boston Children's Harvard back in 1965 in the New England Journal of Medicine actually described an extraordinarily inbred Irish Catholic family. So I knew of the paper, it's an important paper in our field, but I did not pay attention to the fact that it was probably linked to the Irish traveler community. And in this paper, they described 12 infants for 360 individuals in a family where they died from a fatal disease of the reticoendothelial system with eosinophilia. What a beautiful way of saying in the old days of skid, severe coma immunodeficiency. And this was a variant of skid uh, now called Omen syndrome after the person who described it for the first time. So this is the face of the baby. You can see that this baby has a rash. The baby is very unhappy, has probably diarrhea and um, lymphadenopathy and just a lot of inflammation. And I want you to keep that in mind, this picture in your head, because we will come back to it during the talk several times. There were also some other genetic disorders described uh, related to the Irish uh, communities in 2012. 
I sort of put out here three papers. I don't want to spend too much time. This is sort of probably too scientific for most of you in the audience. But what is interesting is that having these Irish families and their contribution to science basically discovered a new gene in 2012 called MCM4 that was never described before. And this is um, a paper by Dr. Casanova's groom in JCI and Dr. Hughes from England, and also Sally Lynch's team. And they, they had a nice, um, very basic paper when they linked MCM4 to PRKDC. So again, without uh, these families, you would not be able to know about these genes. So I'm gonna now introduce our patient, take it back a little bit to more um, of a relaxed discussion on a patient. This was a seven day old male born to the United States family of Irish descent, who uh, the family have endogamy. So there are some marriages within the family members and this baby had an indeterminate newborn screening for a kid and a strong family history of rash disease, which we will come back to. The patient at the time when I saw him, it was right New Year's Eve, was asymptomatic. Uh, the parents reported uh, some knowledge of relatedness, uh, but they have distant history of skin on both sides, but they didn't really know much about it. Looking back, they, they even called this disease more of a rash disease than skid. And Dr. Kornman uh, kindly notified us um, about his experience in, in these families and the fact that uh, two other patients were diagnosed in, within the past year at Johns Hopkins, uh, at Johns Hopkins um, Medical Institute, followed by Beth Younger and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, followed by Jen, Jennifer Hyman. So when we saw this baby, um, we saw a couple of very important features of severe combined immune deficiency. The first feature that you can see for yourself is the absence of thymus uh, in this image. So you can see that the thymus that should be sitting right above the heart, it's a big blab, uh, is, is no longer there. It really raises the flag for an abnormal T-cell development. And that was confirmed by the laboratory findings. The patient had very low lymphocyte count, the ALC was 300. Uh, there was full absence of the CD4 and CD8 T cells and B cells. However, the patient still had natural killer cells at normal numbers. And looking at the immunoglobulin profile, we saw absence of IgM, IgA, IgE, and IgG was present, uh, possibly because of the maternal transfer of antibodies during pregnancy. Furthermore, uh, as a part of the workup, uh, we have shown that lymphocyte proliferation to mitogen was absent. So this was a classical teaching case. Um, our fellows learned a lot from this case uh, when the patient was in-house and we diagnosed the patient with T minus, B minus, NK plus kid. Um, and then we did the genetic testing in, in conjunction with the Bormer transplant team and uh, updated Dr. Gordman since he took over the care of this patient. And we found this very interesting heterozygous, compound heterozygous variant of RAG. So I'm just gonna point out to you here that as you can see, there are two RAG variants. Uh, RAG, the first variant has a mutation that is actually immediately terminating the protein at amino acid 897. And the second variant has a deletion that have a, cause a frame shift and um, creates an even shorter RAG protein at um, around 250, 260 amino acid. So what, what we had to prove here, of course, that these genes were coming from the parents separately and we did do, do that. And that sort of confirmed that we have a skid baby with drug deficiency that is um, coming from two sides of the family, two separate genetic defect. So the HA typing of the patient and the siblings were done and the brother was a match. And I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Goldman now. Yeah, so as you can see, this is a very health, other than the rash, a very healthy appearing other than having a Broviac in, in your chest, that's not usually natural, but a healthy appearing uh, baby who looks full term and vigorous, but um, has a diffuse uh, rash that we see typically uh, in this family, you know, when the T cells are getting activated, usually not in the first two weeks of life. And most of the babies, the rash comes on somewhere after the first three to six weeks. So we usually try to get the work up in order um, sometimes we actually have to give antithymocyte globulin or, or, or steroids or, or, or T cell suppression with a calcineurin inhibitor if the rash is getting so bad that the children are getting dehydrated. With uh, this beautiful baby, we were fortunate enough that the brother was a complete match. 
he was heterozygous for the RAG mutation. And so um, we got all our ducks in order and we were able to go to transplant. We didn't have to retreat. And I just have a picture here that with the sunshine coming through the window, getting close to discharge about 15 days after his bone marrow transplant. You can, with, his, with his beautiful mom here, uh, showing that uh, the rash is, is gone and you know the child's doing uh, quite well with uh, conditioning, which we'll talk about uh, when, in the next few slides. So let's talk about drug deficiency. Uh, for some of you in the audience, this could be a new term. Uh, this stands for recombinase activating gene defects. And basically the concept is that when you have a, an immune cell, a B cell or a T cell, it is carrying a receptor on its surface to recognize the antigens. And the B cell and the T cell receptor has an, an area that is, has to sort of recombine several times to create the diversity that we need to recognize all these foreign antigens like bacteria and viruses throughout our life. And this recombination process, the reshuffling of the genes are highly dependent on RAG. This is the first step uh, in the VDJ recombination, and there will be other enzymes that are important in the, in the rest of the process. So when we think about RAG deficiency, we think about different types of RAG deficiency. Uh, the one on the left is a severe combined immune deficient patient. Uh, these patients um, have severe infections, fail to thrive, and no T cells or B cells. There is no RAG activity, so they cannot create any T or B cell repertoire. And we are fortunate that we no longer see these patients in, in such a grave, grave shape. We, we find them through newborn screening, as you have seen um, in the previous slides. There is a variant of uh, RAG deficiency called Omen syndrome. And this is the disease that I showed you that was described in the 1960s. This syndrome, again, is a unique uh, disease because you have some T cells and B cells, but very little amount. And they come out um, from the thymus and the bone marrow and they just start to proliferate. And that proliferation uh, causes an inflammatory milieu that, that uh, will create this very red eczema-like uh, features of the skin, uh, diarrhea, hepatosplenomegaly. And the third group of uh, RAG deficiency, and we're not gonna touch on that more during the talk, is actually of very high interest to our group. Uh, here we have a bit more reg reg activity present, and these patients present much later, but with more autoimmune disorders. And interestingly, we are working with some collaborators in the Amish community, and we have found fundamental mutations with this type of reg deficiency with the combined immune deficiency genes. I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Goldman again. This is one of our, our very first patients. Um, and again, this, this, this little girl actually needed to be treated as we were working her up for transplant. Um, and just if it shows you what a dramatic response you can, you can see once you, you calm down the uh, proliferative T cell response. And we've had both mixed, uh, some of our boys, we've, we've demonstrated uh, maternal engraftment, you know, by doing XY fish of the, of the T cells with cell sorting. And sometimes they're auto-reactive T cells. I think more often in, in we're seeing autoreactive T cells, not uh, maternally engrafted uh, T cells as causing the rash disease. This is our very first patient that, I, that we met in, in the early 2000s, um, Martin, before. Um, so the, we did not start doing uh, screening. We, we knew back from the CHLA that, that there was a mutation in RAG1, and we knew that it was a founder effect, we assumed. And we, so we, we assumed also it was homozygote. Uh, and in fact, our very first patient in 2008 that we actually sequenced for, I'll get into why we started, re started sequencing everybody as, as it became more commercially available, um, we, was, was a homozygote uh, patient. So we assumed that was what we would find, uh, only to find, as, as Dr. Walters has talked about our current patient, three years later, our next patient that we sequenced did not have homozygous mutation, had a second mutation. Then we knew there were really two mutations floating around um, in the extended family. And since then, we've actually, as you can see, we've had of our last uh, six patients, four of them have been heterozygous and two have been homozygous, including patient nine is the patient that we're presenting here today. On this slide, I just want to point out that usually, as I tell the family and usually the NICU doctors and the OBs, not very um, difficult, even before the newborn screen, they're extremely lipopenic at birth. Usually, they may not be lipopenic when the rash comes, 
but between birth and three or four weeks of life, they have almost, you know, 100 to 300 t uh, lymphocytes, all NK cells. So you have very low numbers for most patients of CD4, CD8, and CD19 cells. As, as you can see, the very first patient, Martin, we saw at a later age with rip roaring Omen syndrome, you know, diffuse rash. And of course, this patient had the, had lots of T cells. Um, so it, you can tell what your T cell numbers are by looking at, at, at the patient and where they are in their journey uh, with the skin. The reason we really started um, sequencing everybody, we'll get to in the next few slides. And I, I think you had a very important point then in our last discussions that please make a note that the B cells are almost fully absent in this um, in this type of rec deficient population. So there were, there were some subtle signs that we are not picking up on uh, compared to other disorders in this population. So when we went back to the report on the genetic defect, um, it was very obvious that uh, both of the mutations are pathogenic and um, and then you can also see that not, they were not present in population databases. So I went to GNOMAD. GNOMAD is a, a big population database. And I was trying to see if we would find of European origin or in particular like, not, like Finnish versus non-Finnish European origin of these genes. And it was very hard to track them down in GNOMAD. So we were not sure if these are genetic defects that will come uh, as, they, as the patients are already in the United States and they acquired it during that time or were they actually acquired uh, before they came to the United States through their ancestry. And uh, so for that reason, we started to call around and talk to the other collaborators uh, around us. And we are very for uh, fortunate that both Dr. Elizabeth Young and Jennifer Heimel were available. And they did confirm to us that they had also patients from the same clan with variants of these uh, reg one allelic variations, either in homozygous or compound heterozygous form. And we were also fortunate that we could talk to Dr. Ronan Leahy, and um, he, is, he has been like tremendously helpful in understanding the disease in Ireland. And he and Sally, Sally Lynch together actually described to us that in the original 2017 paper from Sally, there was one, one rec deficient patient with the, the 775 deletion A, the, the green variant. And Dr. Lee, he mentioned to us that he actually had a poster in ISID where he has shown uh, another rec deficient patient with the second variant, the red variant. So it was becoming more obvious to us that probably these variants um, were coming um, to the community in the United States possibly through this whole migration of the Irish travelers from Ireland. And um, we also talked to Dr. January, who also confirmed uh, other Irish travelers in the United Kingdom having this variant. So what has been really exciting to us, um, and this is an international collaboration now, is that we think that these, these genetic disorders probably were in the gene pool for decades and decades and hundreds of years. And I must mention that talking to the families, there is still a lot of um, um, like migration happening from Ireland and people going back to Ireland and marrying um, the people in Ireland. So there is a possibility that there is a constant influx of, um, of genetic um, enhancement um, through these processes. So I'm gonna hand it on to Dr. Goldman again. So um, we've been uh, pretty successful, not over the past, uh, two decades, but with our transplants to the family, our first choice is always a sibling uh, that we've always proven is immuno immunosufficient <laughs> prior to transplant. And our regimen is pretty straightforward. It's, it's a fully ablative regimen, uh, especially with the either the autoreactive T cells or the, or the natural killer cells that are present in all the, the children. We combine a, a anti-thymocyte globulin, usually the rabbit uh, form, with a targeted busulfan. We target towards the lower end because these are still babies. We try to transplant the first four months of life, if, if at all possible. Um, but we do PK-directed uh, busulfan. We give cytoxan. And the GVH prophylaxis depends on the type of transplant. We take a mi minimalist approach for the babies that have a sibling or, or even a non-sibling matched family member. We just give methotrexate for a few doses. 
and no long-term immunosuppression, but for the unrelated core blood, which is our second go-to, if we don't have a sibling or a matched family member, we either use cyclosporin or tacrolimus and uh, Delcept or MMF for a brief period through day 30. We try to wean as quickly as possible, even sometimes weaning prior to that, even for the, for the, um, for the unrelated cores. So this is our results um, and of our nine surviving patients. At the, the, you can see there's a pretty even split between the siblings and the unrelated core bloods. And we did do one uh, from a baby from Hagerstown, Maryland, patient five. The maternal grandmother happened to match. So we did, the, uh, we harvested mom, the, term, the grandmom for the, for the little baby and, and the baby's done, the child's done really well since then. Um, all our patients that are surviving, the eight patients that are long-term survivors with RAG1 or assume RAG1 have completely normal immune systems. I see them once or a year if they remember to come. Uh, none of them are on IVIG and they're all been vaccinated and demonstrated good pneumococcal titers, et cetera. Um, the one patient that we had that we believe is RAG1 that passed away was in 2002. It's actually the older sibling of patient three, a beautiful baby named Jane Ann, who died of, unfortunately, about a month post-transplant, developed an acute EBV lymphoproliferative disease, uh, and she, she passed with EBV despite receiving rituximab and, you know, and, and, and the aggressive uh, antiviral therapy. She, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, passed away, um, and that was a sibling that uh, matched transplant. But all other the other nine patients have been long-term survivors. So I show this beautiful picture. This is from actually Jane Ann and Ed's mom sent this to me of three of our transplant survivors who are at their communion. They they sent me to include me in the celebration. I love this picture a lot. Um, um, Ed, who's patient three, had a uh, unrelated core blood. Martin is our first patient. He had a, a sibling transplant, I believe. And then the middle is um, James or, or Jimmy, a very sweet boy that was born in Orange County, California. And we got a call from our colleague at Children's Hospital Orange County. Hey, Stan and Carl, I have a, a, one, one of your babies. Can we send them to you? But what was unusual is that James uh, was very IUGR. Most of these babies, as, I, as you've seen, the picture of the most recent index case, are vigorous, healthy, full-term newborns. This baby was, was, was much smaller and was, had, had some microcephaly. But we initially just chalked that up to uh, must have been IUGR unrelated to the, to the immunodeficiency. The baby was truly immunodeficient. Um, it was prior to TREC analysis, but had, but had a few hundred T cells. B cells, even the first week of life, and never had omens uh, like rash. So just this past month, we've had a baby born in Fort Worth uh, who is related to patient is the is the is the niece of patient two and three who will be, believe are rag. I mean, our index case and three who are rag one patient patients. But this baby, like James, uh, was IUGR. It's the mom's second baby. The first baby had was, was a miscarriage. And this baby failed the newborn screen. And I've never seen this before in the family. The baby has rash at birth. And the rash looks a little different. It almost looks like ichthyosis with an extreme peeling. This is in the, in the delivery room in Fort Worth with about 300 T cells at birth, which um, we'll look at. But, uh, we gave uh, rabbit ATG while we're sorting out uh, possible donors for the baby, and we sequenced for RAG, which we've been doing now since 2008, and it came back a couple weeks later as normal. So that, that's when the panic kind of started. And even despite ATG, as you can see in the right corner, it's pretty small, just an incredible T cell proliferation in this baby, you know, over, over 17,000 T cells um, that uh, were causing a lot of weepy skin rash, uh, weight loss. You know, inability. We're trying to gain weight so we can get to transplant eventually, and um, not really diarrhea, mainly just skin manifestation uh, and intermittent fever. She did respond 
pretty nicely to attack reliance if given as a um, just as a T cell functional suppression and the rash improves. And she's actually right now being conditioned for a um, unrelated core blood transplant. She's receiving busulfan day two. So I begged uh, Invite to keep the DNA from the RAG1 and to uh, expand the profile to their more uh, inclusive 470 gene profile for, for, uh, for immunodeficiency. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Oh, here it is. So the, uh, this baby was or is homozygous for uh, possible, probably another founder mutation in the, in the family for, uh, for NHEJ1. Uh, it's kind of the opposite of RAG, putting the chromosome back together for the uh, non-homologous uh, and joining uh, one. So this is, I, of course, I never heard of this before, so I, I'm, a, I'm a hematologist, not an immunologist, but I hit the books and the papers immediately. I still have not found a good explanation why the name of the protein is, is known as, I think it's pronounced Sononis or Sononis, uh, which is a Celtic god, shown to your right from an ancient uh, Celtic uh, carving. But as I was saying, it's, it's part of the, the non-homologous joining factor. And I read uh, actually Andy's paper about ligase 4 being a, a skid that's been reported previously with microcephalic dwarfism and Omen syndrome at birth, or Omen syndrome uh, as it's been reported with, with ligase 4 deficiency. So I was I was betting it was going to be ligase 4 when we finally got the panel back, but it was a, 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 a protein in a very similar pathway, Cernonis or, or, or NH. EF1. Um, and again, this one has been described as well with micro, microcephal uh, and, and dwarfism and immunodeficiency, but I don't believe there's ever been a report of the skin rash in this particular mutation, um, as far as I know. So, so we think, and we just recently, uh, I, had, I saw Jimmy this week, and I uh, did a, 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 a buckle swab. Obviously, his, his, his bone marrow is donor, but I did a buckle swab for uh, the NHEJ1, and so we should know in the next couple of weeks. But we assume that he probably has the identical uh, uh, homozygous mutation as, as the little girl that we're currently treating. Next slide. So in the past, the reason that we really feel honored to take care of this family is we... We, they, they have trusted us with their, with their children, but we also, many more children that we've transplanted do not have skids, but are born. The family, of course, is aware. And so we've armed them with this letter in the past before newborn screening. So tell the OBs, the busy OBs and the NICU and the, and the pediatricians what to draw you know, at birth. And we've always taken the attitude that if you're part of the family and whether any immediate family members, you know, brother, sister, first cousin, have kids, you should screen every newborn. This is before, to, before uh, U.S. Uh, wide screening. And so we, we have them all do a, a CBC and lymphocyte count, T and B cell subset, and uh, an IgM level, just as a very rough screen. And if anything is a little bit off, we have them come to our office or go to a near center if, if they're not, not in the Dallas-Fort Worth area to get more in-depth studies. Now, We've kind of told them to throw out the letter now that, that the newborn screens because I have not encountered any child that hasn't failed the TREC analysis. Uh, so, you know, we just basically said at this point, you know, isolate until you have your, new, your first newborn screen back. So here, I, I just want to take back uh, a little bit and, and talk about not just the babies, but their parents. So these are basically some of the children that we know of in this community. Um, I sort of highlighted them where they are from and how many of them. But what about the parents? Like how can we help this, uh, the parents and their preparation for having another child in the family? And that's where the whole Skid Compass um, initiatives are coming in. How can we help the community to do a better job in finding uh, people at risk? 
So we actually are fortunate to now have a, a map of 130 uh, memory, family members of this uh, kindred uh, with the three sk distinct skid variants. You can see on the left is the red reg variant, um, there is the green reg variant, and the new non-homologous end joining variant. And uh, you can see that these families that are coming from this very you know, large extended um, um, initial uh, marriage uh, are coming down and, and we, we see the genes popping up in different um, branches of the family. So we don't know, of course, who is a carrier current and who is not, but it, it really shows the importance of screening and advising the parents and then the other, other new members of the families who are about to get married to consider evaluation. And um, we would like to do this um, evaluation as a continued research project, but also an advocacy project. So the question that we are asking, uh, and of course we are very curious about your thoughts and input is that should we diagnose at birth or before birth? Um, we are uh, engaging family members now to have this conversation ongoing. Should we screen the parents for carrier state and then potentially the babies who are coming to life? Should that be an earlier diagnosis so we are more ready to take care of them be before they come to life and uh, potentially develop Orman syndrome? The social challenges, uh, again, in the past uh, year, at least four babies were born with the skid, one, three with drag and one with non homologous and joining from this community, but there is no targeted genetic screening program currently available for them. And we really would like to use this opportunity to find the carriers uh, that are predisposing for SCID. Uh, the advocacy program could uh, potentially include genetic screening through saliva samples. We would like to publish uh, this cohort with our collaborators around the world, um, not only just the clinical and emergical features, but the social challenges um, of this cohort. And, um, and there could be potential new avenues, uh, for example, metabolic disorders. We know that there are hundreds and uh, like uh, nearly 100 gene defects in Ireland. And could there be some of these defects actually in this community that are unnoticed currently? We are also interested in streamlining for amniocentesis, early genetic testing and HLA typing uh, just for donor selection. And we would like to um, create as culturally sensitive medicine care um, for the, these patients and their families so that they, they really uh, would agree and, and could work with us. So we are building a team, um, please join us. Uh, this work would not be possible without our collaborators around the United States, uh, Dr. Goldman and his team who has been tirelessly taking care of the children at need. Um, we are grateful for the IDF Skid Compass um, program to allow us to do this presentation. Many of the local um, allergist, immunologists and BMT doctors who I work with in Florida, Evan Potts, who is going to be actually taking it on as a research project this summer. And, um, and I would like to thank very specifically Dr. Ronald Leahy, Sandra Lynch from Ireland and Andy Jennery for all of their insight. And I'm, I'm hoping for continued collaboration. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldman. Mm -hmm. no, thank you so much, Dr. Walter and Dr. Goldman. So we do have some time, uh, about 15 minutes or so left. If there is any discussion or questions that those in the audience have for Dr. Goldman, or Dr. Walter, um, the chat should be open and I can also uh, provide everyone with the opportunity to unmute yourselves if you have a question that is a little more complex than you'd rather say than type out. So um, I now open the floor to anyone who has any thoughts or comments. <clears throat> so someone is curious about the decision in Ireland to screen for ADA, but not skid more broadly. Was it based on cost or were there other factors that were connected to that decision? I see that Ronan is actually in the audience. Um, would you be able to chime in for us from Ireland? You can unmute yourself. Uh, hi everyone, can you, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, thank you, we are yes. happy to hear you. Uh, thanks very much, it's a wonderful presentation, Jordan. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, so in short, the, it is purely based on cost. Um, and, and I suppose based on our uh, unique epidemiology. Uh, so in contrast to other countries, 50% of our skids are ADA skid. Uh, and that's really down to the Irish traveler community. Uh, you know, it, 
because they have because of the founder effect, um, it it really skews our epidemiology. Uh, but in short, it's co- it's costs, um, and also in terms of getting the screening off the ground, we should be able to achieve it much quicker with tandem mass spectrometry for ADA SCID. We're hoping to get it started next year. Uh, but of course, we'd love to introduce track analysis, uh, but we're, I think it would just take longer for us to get that off the ground. So it's, it's just cost and logistics, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, I see another question that's come in. Are there leaky versions of omens? Is it possible that a RAG1 diagnosed late, as in five years, could be omens as well? Yes, so this is an important question, and we are now seeing patients presenting with this TH2 type of phenotype sometime later than the typical newborn period. Those uh, patients who have this very, very wide by the leaky TH2 variant um, have can have eczema, and they see also sometimes we see uh, expansion of T cells. So it's not as well described, and uh, I would say we could probably could not call it fully open syndrome, but there are similar variants happening in the combined immune deficiency group that I described uh, in my slide. And I, I truly believe that those patients um, should be probably could be even found with newborn screening. Uh, we have a report in Frontiers about a baby who sort of meets more the combined immune deficiency criteria than the skid. So yes, it could be happening a bit later and uh, there's a lot of unknown still about how, how the pathophysiology of that phenotype is. I guess there are no that other is currently, questions. Yeah. yeah, that is currently all the questions that I see coming in, Dr. Walter and Dr. Goldman. Yes. I, oh. I do want to emphasize oh, I, the importance of this Irish community and there may be some, some of you from the community in the audience. Uh, there are very, very big global efforts in understanding how to transplant drug deficient patients and the inboard error working party in, the, in Europe and the PIDTC in the United States is, is putting out some um, data on it. There are going to be publications coming, but I think what is really unique in the Irish community is that you have only two reg variants. So it's a very sort of restricted um, RAG activity level. And, uh, and the, the higher frequency of Omen syndrome is astonishing, like how many patients develop Omen syndrome from this community. So I think this community alone um, with the transplant outcomes and, and biology of the disease will tell us so much that we could not have done without um, understanding the community better. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the collaboration for scientifically and personally too, because I really enjoy interacting with the families. Thank you. And to add to that, I, I do think that um, although our outcome is pretty pretty good, you know, we there's opportunity to reduce the conditioning regimen. And you know, we've had a lot of VOD, uh, infectious complications, unfortunately, uh, very excellent survival, but, um, I think that'd be an area of, I think of active research that we'd love to collaborate, you know, with other centers on. I also see another question coming in saying, could you share more about what screening for carrier state would look like in parents? Would you offer carrier screening for relatives of the parents, for example, their brothers or sisters upon identification of a baby with skid or would this be a preventative screening? Our goal in this research project is to offer it uh, to the community without any limitations. So of course we would like the parents and their close family members screened and we probably can do it um, even through clinical grants. But uh, the, the whole idea behind our project and we hope for to get funding for it is to screen, to offer screening to any member of the community. And the reason is that as you have seen, there are basically three different variants circulating in this community and you want to know who is having what and what is the risk of them passing it on to their babies. Um, it, it's very simple to get a saliva kit um, sent to the family so you don't have to go to see your doctor. You can just get the saliva kit and um, obtain a sample at home and send it back to the company. So this is a, an era where we can do so much that we couldn't do before. And we, we are really eager to help everyone in this community. Mm-hmm. 
Um, there's also another question, uh, Dr. Goldman. Uh, someone is interested if Texas performs DNA sequencing similar to what um, New York State does. Um, for for skids, if, if the track is negative, as far as far as I'm aware, I'm very familiar with this. Obviously, sickle cell. Uh, we do we do sequence that in, in Texas now for the hemoglobinopathy. I don't think skids they don't because. I've been getting lots of paperwork from the state of Texas following up. Do you know the mutation yet for the, the kids who have failed the TREC screen here? That get, so I don't think that they, Texas has a program for that. It would be great, though. Yes, we actually are developing uh, with, with developed countries like Brazil and Eastern Europe. Um, our laboratory has been in, in touch with them and helping them to diagnose right from the newborn screening card. This is a new effort. That would be tremendous help to families when they have the baby's blood spot right in the newborn screening program. And besides knowing that it's low track, they would get the genetic data back. So we hope it will happen in the United States in the next five to 10 years, but we don't know when it will happen in all of the states. All right, well, thank you guys for inviting me. Thank you so much, Dr. Golden. Thank you so much for the opportunity and we are wishing the best for everybody. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye. Take care and thank you everyone.